disability is a part of human diversity. There are one billion individuals in this world with disabilities. We want to have a say in everything that affects us. You can't have racial justice or economic justice or gender justice without disability justice. To actually achieve any of those things requires achieving all of those things. True inclusion is revolutionary. continue to hear that representation matters, and yet representation often leaves out 15% of the global population, and that's people with disabilities. That's a billion people. Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Frances Steed Sellers, a senior writer here at The Post. This afternoon, we're going to be talking about the status of the disability rights movement and also representation in the media. I'm delighted to welcome my first two guests. Raymond McCoy McDeed is the executive director of the National Council on Independent Living, and Andrea Levant is the president of Levant Consulting. She was also an impact producer on the 2020 documentary Crip Camp that really put the spotlight on the disability rights movement. A very warm welcome to you both, Rema and Andrea. Thank you so much. Delighted to be here. We are very, yeah. we're absolutely delighted to have you. In the top right-hand corner, you'll see we have Veronica signing ASL for us. And in prepping for this conversation and learning to be more inclusive, I've decided to start with a visual description of where I am. I'm in front of a bookcase at home at my laptop and I'm wearing a white short sleeve jacket in the hope of warding off the heat. I'm white, and as you can probably hear from my accent, I'm British American. Rayma, maybe you can go next, and then Andrea, maybe you could follow up. Absolutely, thank you, Francis. Uh, my name's Rima McCoy McDeed. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a black American woman with a light complexion, uh, long natural brown hair, I'm wearing tortoiseshell glasses, a white top, and I'm seated in a white room with two bookshelves behind me. Thank you, Andrea. Maybe you can go now. Absolutely. I am Andrea Levant. I use she, her pronouns. I am a black woman uh, with chin length hair, and I'm wearing gold glasses, cat eye glasses with pearls wearing red lipstick and a black and white polka dot top. I am sitting in my home office living room with a variety of decor around me, including a teal couch and some books. Thank you both very much for those thoughtful descriptions. And Andrea, I'd like to ask you, your, part of your mission is to speak disability with confidence. I'd love to hear from both of you what that means and the impact of it. And maybe Andrea, you could start. That's a great question. Thank you. It really means disability, you know, is so we talk about the fact that it is not a, a monolith, which means that it doesn't look the same. And it really means that people need to understand us. And um, for so often we've been left out of conversations. And so our role is not um, my in the work that we do. It's not just to um, display disability, but to ensure that people really understand us, understand our perspectives, um, our experiences, uh, to really create a more inclusive uh, world where we know and feel like we belong. Rama, that's so interesting. Maybe you can uh, tell from your perspective the meaning of how important language is in this discussion. So with regards to 
conversations about the intersection of disability and confidence. Uh, to borrow a term from uh, the LGBTQ community uh, circa mid 1990s, we are everywhere. And so ensuring that conversations are inclusive of the disability community, of disabled people specifically, is part of how I communicate around disability with confidence. Delivering the message uh, at every available opportunity that when disabled people benefit, entire the entire society in which we live in benefits. And so prioritizing, ensuring that the most marginalized amongst us, that would be disabled people, particularly those of us who are both disabled and racially marginalized, prioritizing our needs ensures that everybody's needs are met. And so that's how I articulate about disability um, in, a, in, in a confident capacity. Those are both such important messages. And I, I just wanted to say that I've worked both as a, a writer and editor at The Post and I understand some of the complications of getting language right and how it can evolve. And of course, just wanted to comment that you should let me know if any of my language is not uh, uh, does not meet the, the right approach at any point. And we at The Post are always wanting to learn about how to communicate pro properly and to um, be as inclusive as possible. Which brings me to a question about um, inclusivity in media. Andrea, may maybe you can pick up and talk to me a little bit about uh, the representation of disability in the media. Well, you know, it's it's a great another great question. The fact is that while we are seeing more, and Crip Camp was certainly a um, brought disability into a, a space and into a light that that was unfamiliar for so many people. Um, there still is so much more that needs to be done when it comes to uh, disability representation. We're seeing it sprinkled here and there, and yet there's still so many tropes. Um, around how disability is presented, whether that's inspirational, whether that's as the superheroes, and really what we, uh, there's, there's more to be done and just ensuring that disabled people are depicted really fully and wholly um, as, as humans with lived experiences that are valuable. Um, and so there's a lot more to be done when it comes to representation. Um, we're still not on your screens and the fact is that when we don't see ourselves represented then it is really showing us that we are not um honestly that we're not worthy that we're not valuable that we shouldn't be here and so um there's so much more that needs to be done when it comes to uh, media representation but grateful that um that we are seeing improvements every day so Rayma, one of the most striking statistics that I've read is that one in four Americans live with disability, and yet, um, as Andreas just said, um, are underrepresented in the media. Do you see change happening? And if so, how is that being accomplished? I do see change happening. Um, it's subtle, but it's happening. Uh, I want to go back, Francis, to a, a, a comment that you made about the Washington Post's commitment to uh, using the correct language, being inclusive of disabled people. Because I have a solution for, for you and for, for all media outlets, and it's a very simple solution. Um, and it's so simple that sometimes it gets lost in, in the shuffle as far as how do we enhance the inclusivity of disabled people in, in the media. The solution is to ensure that, that we have journalists on staff who are disabled, uh, that we have decision makers um, on staff who are disabled um, because they bring with them, along with their skills, qualifications, talents, and, and attributes, uh, that, that, that personal experience, that, that lived experience, that, that is going to ensure that they have that the imperative that's really needed to ensure that that stories and content that's specific to disabled people is being prioritized and brought brought forward. Thank you for those comments. Those are really important. Um, it's important for, for you to share that and for us all to hear it. So thank you very much, Rayma. Often, and I think there was a Foundation study on this. 
people with disabilities have fallen into stereotypes and somewhat negative stereotypes. Again, I'd love to hear your thoughts, and Andrea, maybe you can help me first with this, um, about overcoming those very narrow views of disability. Yes, so even the concept of overcoming is, is very uh, interesting, and we um, within the disability community are kind of even tired of that, that that kind of concept because disability really is a a lived experience um and so it's something that isn't doesn't require even something that need, that needs to be overcome but really to be accepted and to be embraced and so with that i think there is um just when it comes to even overcoming kind of the stereotypes therein it's continuing to depict uh the full lives of disabled people um the fact that we love the fact that we you know work the fact that we you know have full lives that that really are are um that we should be embraced and accepted in that way and so it's not just one specific um you know when we talk about just how we're presented that it needs to be in that very full way so this is a that's another very key point. And and Rayma, one of the things is that there are disabilities that are visual and one can make efforts to portray them and show them. But how about media representation of unseen disabilities? Again, are media falling short on that? And are you seeing change? Well, that is a fantastic question for somebody like me to answer, isn't it? <laughs> I am a person that experiences a non-apparent disability. I'm on the autism spectrum, diagnosed way back in 1986. And so if somebody's just looking at me, um, uh, they're, they're not going to know because autism doesn't have a certain look about it, certainly. Um, and, uh, and so I actually present with, uh, in, in, in comparison to many people on the autism spectrum or many people in the disability community with a, a fair amount of privilege. And I, I fully acknowledge that. The, 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 the key to ensuring uh, that there's visibility for those of us who do not um, present with a disability and therefore experience, uh, you know, uh, quote unquote, abled appearing privilege is again, to reference a, a previous answer of mine, ensure that we're prioritizing that the, the people who are seeking the content, who are driving the stories, who are, 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 are um, at, have the opportunity to create narratives. Uh, so journalists and, and other decision makers in the media Ex themselves experience uh, disabilities, non-apparent disabilities, which brings me to an, a, a point that I think is very important for this audience to consider. 75% of people who are employed and experience a disability do not disclose that they experience a disability um, at their place of employment. Now, the why behind that certainly merits a lot of unpacking. But stigma is definitely at the core of that. And so I like to remind folks that more often than not, uh, whether you are cognizant of it, you are interacting with, with people who experience disabilities. Um, and, and that is the case in the media. Um, that's the case in every sector um, imaginable. Um, and, and so keeping that in mind, um, you know, and also keeping in mind the fact that there, there are subtle shifts happening as far as representation and inclusion of disabled people in media content. Um, for, for, for anybody that's in the audience that has, has decision-making authority in, in the media, you know, start asking questions about more than likely there are individuals that work here who experience disability. What are the barriers that they perceive in this work environment that compels them to not disclose their personal experience of disability. What can we do to, to dismantle those barriers? And how can that in turn be a powerful mechanism that leads to inclusion and, 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 and amazing content from, from, from a, a disability vantage point? 
Yeah, thank you so much. Andrea, you were part of this incredible movie, Crip Camp, that came out in 2020, an award-winning movie. It didn't allow people to forget about disability. It put it there right in the mainstream. Tell me about the impact it's had in the fight for equity. Yes, well, that, that's the big thing. Crip Camp really did bring um, a movement that honestly, you know, has been happening for, for decades to the forefront. It was so interesting um, for those of us that have been in this work for, for you know, quite a while to see the reactions in the world to uh, what really was essentially a hidden movement around the disability rights um, movement and, and the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act and even before that, um, the 504 sit-ins to led to significant legislation for disability. But even beyond that, what the movie really depicted was those lived experiences of disabled people and what the power of community building really is. Um, when we come together, um, how change really can be affected. And so um, the response within the world has been amazing. Um, and yet it's also really brought us to today, which is 31 years past um, the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it's acknowledging that the disability rights movement, and we're incredibly grateful for each person that um, played a part and continues to play a part in that, um, there's still it, the acknowledgement of where uh, improvement and advancement needs to happen specifically when it comes to multi multiply marginalized communities. Um, and so it's bringing together the, con the disability rights with disability justice um, and, and, and elevating and bringing to light the stories of, of those of us like Rima and myself um, who are, are disabled women of color and really acknowledging the disparities and the work that still needs to be done uh, to really enhance the lives of disabled people. I have a quick follow up question on that and then one for you, Rima, too. But Andrea, you were the first black woman with a visible disability to be on that Oscar red carpet, that iconic scene. Tell me personally what it meant to be that first and also what it means to be a role model for others. Ha, ah, um, it was an incredible experience. It, it really was to be. Um, kind of the, the, ver the like you said, the first black uh, visibly disabled woman. And yet um, it it remains, all of these conversations, quite honestly, are like this bittersweet um, feeling because of the fact that we, uh, again, 31 years past the ADA and these are firsts, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so in one way, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful and um, so excited about the work to come. And yet am, you know, wanting there to be more. Um, desiring there to be more opportunities um, for us, for all of us, um, and to, you know, ensure that there's not just room at the table, but that there's opportunities, um, you know, for us to, to really affect change um, and to ensure that, you know, to Rima's point earlier, um, that we're decision makers. And so, you know, representation certainly matters. Uh, being in a room totally matters, being at the Oscars totally matters. Um, and yet uh, it's it's what we'll see happens next year that really is gonna show whether um, there was a, a permanent impact that was made. So I'm anticipatory um, more for what is to come um, than what we've already seen. Rima, let me follow up with you because you also are a first, the first black person to lead a national disability coalition. Again, follow up if you can and tell me about the importance for you personally and also for the organization as it moves ahead. Well, I really want to amplify um, what Andrea articulated around the, 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 a lot of bittersweet feelings around the, the being the so-called first black person to do something. It's 2021, folks. Uh, I don't know about anybody that, that's with us this afternoon, but when I was a child thinking about the 21st century, I thought we would have flying cars by now. I did not think that we would still be having conversations about first black person to do this. Uh, 
first apparently disabled person to do this. <laughs> you know, those first really should have happened a generation ago. And so, yes, it's very bittersweet uh, to be the first Black person to lead a national disability organization. But I can't help but think about the countless other folks who've come before me, who, uh, including Black disabled folks that I, I consider to be my mentors, uh, Deidre Davis Butler, Stan Holbrook, uh, who, who should have been the first uh, Black person to lead a national disability organization. And so I, I can't help but, but think about the fact that I truly stand on the shoulders of giants as I step into my role. And this is my third week at the National Council on Independent Living. Um, but uh, with standing on, on the shoulders of giants, really recognizing the gravity of, of that and, and ensuring that as I move forward, as I support this organization to move forward, that what we're talking about this afternoon infuses the organization. We are truly standing at a precipice as we shift from uh, disability rights into disability justice. And for those of you who are, are with us this afternoon, who perhaps are wondering, well, what's the difference between the two of those? Well, right, rights are all about creating parallels, not intersections. They're about creating space at a table that wasn't built for us in the first place. And justice is all about recognizing that and saying, hey, let's co-create a new table, an inclusive table, an accessible table, and stop expecting people who are disabled to gather themselves around a table that not only wasn't designed for them, but is not accessible to them, and then expecting us to be grateful for that opportunity. And so that's my hope, uh, that's my prayer moving forward. Uh, and, and so again, very appreciative of this conversation. That's such an important point that I'd wanted to raise about this pivot from disability rights to disability justice. But I think there are other things that we sometimes don't talk about. And Andrea, maybe we're getting close to the end, but maybe Andrea, you can pick up a little bit on this. And that's questions that come from the so-called able-bodied community about how best to support the disabled community. And maybe Andrea, you could just address that for me. Move out the way. <laughs> Uh, I mean, honestly, it's really just, um, we know ourselves, we know our needs, we, you know, the, and it's not, again, it's, it's not a, a monolithic experience. So it's not just that one in four working adults have disabilities, it's one in four black adults have disabilities, it's one in five indigenous adults have disabilities, one in six Latinx adults have disabilities, one in 10 Asian adults have disabilities and the list goes on when we bring in other intersections. And so um, with that, it means that, you know, we're uh, the best way to support is to ensure that we are, uh, that you're not just um, doing something for us, but that you're doing things with us, uh, that you're from the very beginning, um, it's about being proactive, not reactive. So, oh goodness, now we've created this event and somebody has asked for an accommodation and we need to fix it. But it's like, all right, we desire to do X, Y, Z. And so we're going to um, ensure that disabled um, uh, and, and intersectional disabled voices are uh, a part of every planning process, uh, every you know media room, every place where a decision is ultimately gonna be made. Um, that we're with you from the very beginning. That's such a wonderful forward-looking message. Uh, Rima, if we could finish with you, um, what is your single message um, as we move ahead about the next step that needs to be taken to create this kind of inclusivity that Andrea was just talking about? That's a fantastic question. You know, and, and so I have an ask for everybody that's listening this afternoon or evening if you're across the pond. And, and it's this, you know, do you, do you know what the definition of privilege is? It's one of the, the words that has very, very rapid, well, seemingly rapidly entered into the lexicon of, of the English language recently. Do you, and it's privilege is all about having a, a, an understanding of how you show up, what space you take up in the places you inhabit. 
do you have an understanding of what your privilege is? And knowing that, do you have an understanding of instances where you benefit and, and others that you may or may not be cognizant of um, do not benefit? suffer as a result with and i bring that up because the disability community has been hidden in plain sight for so long and until very recently the americans with disabilities act is only 31 years i uh, you know the, the the disability community has because we are living in a world that was not designed to be inclusive of us um has 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 been negatively impacted as a result of that. Now, thanks to things like the Americans with Disabilities Act and the disability rights movement, uh, there is shifting with regards to that. I would like to offer up to folks, especially those of you who are in the audience who are, are disabled, but white, uh, the following. As you have benefited from the disability rights movement, from the Americans with Disabilities Act, how have your racially marginalized peers and colleagues, what, what has, how, how has their lives changed? Have their lives changed? Have our lives changed? And, you know, who is completely not being taken into consideration as far as conversations around disability are concerned? And what can we do to ensure that in a di as we're having conversations about making sure that spaces are accessible and inclusive, we also need to be prioritizing and ensuring that conversations are inclusive as well. Um, and, and that we're not thinking about making accommodations after the fact as Andrea brought up. Because as we see that happening in, in the mainstream, as far as people who are not disabled interfacing with people who are disabled. That also happens in spaces where that are dominated with disabled people. They're making accommodations at the last minute um, to ensure that, that there's space for racially marginalized disabled people. And so all of us, no matter what our experiences are, have an opportunity to think, to think very critically about how you show up in society, how you are benefited from society being as it is, and how people around you do not benefit. And what can we do to ensure that, that we are shift, as we're shifting from disability rights to disability justice, uh, ensuring that, that we are truly creating a just and verdant society for all. The reality is, is that white has been the default setting for disability for, for long enough. And now it's time for us to all together stand at that intersection of race and disability and figure out what our roles and responsibilities are and move forward together. Rima and Andrea, thank you both very much for that insightful conversation and also for the very proactive as opposed to reactive message you're leaving us with. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I'll be back in a few moments with Jen Dearenwater to continue this conversation. I'm Frances Steed Sellers, a senior writer at the Washington Post. Thank you for joining us. I'm about to speak with Jen Dearenwater, a journalist whose work focuses on the intersectionality of disability and other civil rights. A very well, warm welcome to you, Jen. Hi, it's nice to be here with you. 
And in the upper right corner, we have Vern signing for us. Thank you. And Jen, I'd like to start again with a brief visual description, if you would be so gracious as to give that to our audience. Yeah, of course. So I am a light complected indigenous two spirit woman. Um, I have my hair pulled back. It's uh, brown hair. I'm wearing black glasses, um, a sort of turquoise colored T-shirt and some white multicolored beaded earrings. I'm sitting in a brown office chair and behind me you can kind of see into my kitchen and there's a, a little sign up on my bulletin board that says support local news. And I have a bookcase behind me. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Jen, one of the fascinating things is how many uh, different areas uh, of rights you're involved in, this huge intersection, LGBTQIA2S, um, your indigenous background and the disability rights. I can think of nobody better to walk us through the challenges and opportunities of managing these various different areas of concern. And interest. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for me, when I talk about any aspect of my identity and my communities, they all go together. You know, I don't, you know, my, my identities don't exist within silos. The oppression and the issues that I face on the daily are surround all around being a bisexual, two-spirit, disabled Native woman. Um, you know, I can't separate out all those kinds of oppression and uh, you know, Rima and Andrea touched on this some before we started talking, but the disability community is vast and diverse. We're the most diverse group of oppressed people. You know, we represent every racial and ethnic group, ages, types of ability, or excuse me, types of disabilities, you know, geographic locations, uh, sexualities, genders, you know, we're, we're a broad community. And so for me, you can't leave any of those aspects behind. You can't leave any of those community members behind. And I really do feel like disability justice ultimately means justice for everyone. So I'm curious, in the various conversations you have, and as you um, look at all these different areas, do you prioritize some over others in some area, or can you manage to bring them all together coherently? I think that it's possible to bring them all together coherently. You know, we need to be, you know, honest and open with the stories and conditions of people's lives. And I think that that's more than something that we're not, that we're more than capable of doing and bringing that together. You know, I, I work a lot on specifically my communities because I feel like that's, that's my experience. Um, but, you know, when I talk about those of us that are considered American Indian and Alaska Native, and I, I say considered because those are not the terms we use to define ourselves. It's what the white man uses to define us. But when I talk about Native community, when I, when I do that work, I'm always having to think about what my whole community looks like. And it's vast and it's broad. And we have to do that work and do it in an intersectional way or we leave people behind. When I was doing some research for this show, I was struck by how little literature exists at the intersection of race and disability. Is that changing now? Not quickly enough. Um, I think that, as Rema had pointed out, a lot of disability rights um, organizations have been primarily led by white people. Um, and we, we don't have the data that we need. Um, you know, we, we do know that American Indian and Alaska Native community has uh, disability rates of anywhere from 22 to 24% of our community. Um, and that's based on the data we have. But we also, if you look at data that exists, you can see that there are populations as high as 50% of indigenous communities with disabilities. Um, you know, so we need more data and we need uh, we need deeper, deeper dives into data and, and figuring out how ableism is impacting our BIPOC people. You are a Cherokee citizen and come from this tremendous tradition of, of storytelling. How has that affected, pers more personally than collecting data, but how has that affected your uh, means of telling 
this great story at the intersection of race and disability. Mm -hmm. um, well, storytelling is a traditional indigenous value. Um, speaking to my people specifically, um, I'm Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. And we Cherokee people actually had the first written syllabary of the indigenous people on these lands that we refer to as Turtle Island. Um, we also, the Cherokee people were the first, uh, the first people to have a tribal newspaper called the Cherokee Phoenix, which runs to this day. So for me, in doing this work as a journalist, I, I am staying within that indigenous way of storytelling. Um, I also think of it as part of my duty to help document my communities um, who so often go unheard and go unseen. And, and that's what brings us here today, you know, doing that work for indigenous people and deaf and disabled and ill people. You know, it's it's trying to use those traditions to bring voice um, to those of us who have been basically, you know, silenced. And you are currently, and congratulations on this, a Disability Futures Fellow at the Ford Foundation. And how are you using that to advance this, uh, this tremendous uh, narrative and storytelling tradition that you come from? Yeah, yeah, the Disability Futures Fellowship is the first of its kind that's specifically for disabled um, artists and creatives. Um, so I'm, I'm one of the 20 fellows and I am the only Native fellow. Um, so I've really been trying to use the platform that I have as a result of this fellowship and the work with Ford to advance the, the stories and the needs of our deaf and disabled and ill indigenous people. Uh, we actually have a big festival coming up next week. It's July 19th and 20th. And on the 20th, um, starting at 1.45 p.m. Eastern time, my organization, Crushing Colonialism, is gonna host a Facebook watch party of a panel on indigeneity and disability in the arts that I was a part of. Well, congratulations on that. That's July the 19th. That's very not very far away at all. I guess about 10 days or even less. Um, so what challenges looking ahead, what challenges lie ahead for communicating about this intersection of disability and race? Can you pinpoint a couple for us? Um, we have so many issues. You know, we are where we are. As, as a community of disabled people because of the abled. Just like as a native, it's primarily non-natives making decisions that impact me and our communities. It's the same for disabled people. You know, this world, this country has been designed by and for the abled and it purposefully keeps us down. You can see that through things like sub-minimum wages. It's legal in this country to pay disabled people less than minimum wage. You know, we can't survive off of SSI or SSDI. We are kept in poverty and that is purposeful. You know, you can see it through state violence. You know, there was a study that came out a few years ago that found that almost half the people killed by the police had a disability. You know, the police make, create disabilities and make them worse. You know, there was a resident of Kenosha, Wisconsin, Jacob Blake, who's now paralyzed from being shot by the police seven times in his back. Um, and that just happened August, 2020. You know, we, we can see these things. We see it, what just happened with the DC Circuit Court overturning the FDA's ban on the use of torturous electroshock on our youth with intellectual disabilities at the Judge Rottenberg Center in Massachusetts. You know, it's still legal under Buck v. Bell Supreme Court case law to sterilize us against our will. You know, Britney Spears speaking out about the conservatorship and being forced to use long acting birth control. Like I can keep going with all of the problems we have ahead of us, which also include the climate crisis and still the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, we need a lot of change from the top down and that includes in media as well. You know, Rayma spoke on this a bit, but, you know, in my research as a journalist, I've never been able to find any data on the number of deaf or disabled journalists in this country. Um, you know, we're out here and we're doing the work, but we're not being seen, you know, and I could say this, I asked this of the Washington Post and all other legacy media, 
You know, how many deaf or disabled journalists do you have on staff? How many of them are black or brown or indigenous? You know, how many of them are leading newsrooms and TV stations and radio stations? You know, I wouldn't be surprised if the answer is in the single digits and quite likely even zero. You know, we have a long way to go still, and it really is the abled who need to step up, step back, and start taking our direction and doing what we say we need. Jen, that brings me to an audience question that came in, and I'd like to read it to you. Um, it's what do most abled people get wrong about the needs of disabled people? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, wow. Um, I'm like, there's Where so stop, many. Right? <laughs> it's a great question, and the answer is everything. Um, I think what I'll say from my own personal experience is what has been the most frustrating aspect of, of being disabled in an ableist world is how the able just don't listen to us. They assume that anything we say isn't real, that we're lying, we're making things up, um, or that we somehow are not capable of thinking and speaking for ourselves. Um, there are a lot of just really horribly discriminatory ideas that I think a lot of able-bodied people have about disabled people. I think we may have lost the sound there. Jen, tell me some of the concrete actions that can be taken. Um, well, concrete actions can include, you know, hiring more press that have disabilities, um, you know, hiring writers for TV shows that have disabilities, you know, using actual disabled people in movies and TV shows. You know, those are just a few for media, but you know, it's also top-down policy change. It's, it really is gonna take society deciding that people like me, that our lives matter. And, and it's really important to remember that the rates of disability are growing as well in this country. Um, so, you know, people need to start standing by us and, and that's gonna take a lot of change within just larger society. So we learned a little bit more about Crip Camp earlier on from Andrea, but tell me, are there any other success stories out there in the media landscape or elsewhere where you'd say, here's a model to follow? Hmm. Well, I think the Disability Futures Fellowship is one example. Um, you know, bringing 20 deaf and disabled and ill you know, creatives together and we all work in different fields and we're all very diverse as well. We come from different backgrounds. I think that's one really good step um, just in helping us to have a voice, to have a platform, um, to have financial and other resources to build our careers. Um, but in terms of, you know, do I see other media like TV shows or movies or, or press getting it right? Not, not really. So let There's, me ask a little bit more. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you, but I was going to ask about the arts um, because I have seen uh, deaf actors, for example, on stage, uh, not acting uh, deaf parts, but on stage. Are you seeing uh, uh, advances there in terms of inclusivity? Well, I mean, there has been more television shows that have come out that. Mm -hmm. So that features surround, you know, disability, such as autism, for example. So we are seeing more of that. But even then, when those shows are coming out, they're primarily showing white, pet, cis people who are disabled or, you know, um, and, and oftentimes also they're cis boys or men. So even within those representations that, that are growing, they're still not really showing the community as a whole. They're still leaving so many of us behind. And I'd like to ask you a little bit more. You've mentioned journalism a number of times and you're obviously a working journalist. There's a difference obviously between abled people covering disability and disabled people writing about their own lives and other lives. Is, are there advances, advances in either of those two areas um, in, in any uh, news organizations across the country?
None that come to mind, honestly. I see, mm -hmm. I do see more independent press, um, and I see a lot more disabled people, you know, doing our own things. Like Alice Wong, who unfortunately isn't with us today, but her organization, Disability Visibility, um, you know, so so we're out here and we're doing the work, but we're not getting the platforms that we need. Um, so I. I feel like there's still a lot of a lot of room to advance, a lot of room to um, to grow. But I'd love to know about blogs and social media and other areas where anybody can speak out. Are they making a difference to you? I think they are. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I see a lot more of the disability community online. I see us mm -hmm. talking about our, our specific issues um, and how they relate to the problems of our time, like COVID-19 or the climate crisis. Um, you know, so that that has been really wonderful, seeing all of this social media, you know, the growth of it and the representation of our communities and, and the things that we need as well. And you write a regular blog. Well, <laughs> I try to. <laughs> I, I have shifted my attention some more recently to focus on two books that I'm working on, but I still will occasionally write a blog entry or, you know, um, publish a news article. So, Jen, let's be a little aspirational. What is the gold standard for disability rights? Oh, gosh. Total accessibility, you know? absolute accessibility on transportation, housing, workplace, education, you know, making sure that every every deaf or disabled or ill person has what they need and not just what we need, but what we deserve, not the bare minimum, but what we really deserve, you know, kind of when I think about the rights of any oppressed people, I think back to the bread and roses speech, um, which I, I can't recall the the woman who gave that speech right now, but you know, she was a union organizer saying, yes, women workers need bread, but they deserve roses too. And in the perfect world, every every one of us would have everything we need and we would be treated with the integrity and the respect that we deserve. And state violence um, that has, has put many of us in the situation we're in, not only would that be gone, but there would be a, a system of, of justice in place for us and for our, our communities and our future generations. Jan, just quickly as a last question, how optimistic are you looking ahead? I'll say that these days I'm not feeling particularly hopeful about the world at large. Um, I, I do feel hopeful though for, for our youth. Um, just in seeing how so many of our disabled youth um, are stepping up and being heard more and more. So I do, I do feel confident in the fact that they're out there and they're doing these things. My faith in the system, that's pretty non-existent these days. Wow, Jen, thank you for the optimism you could share with us and also for such an insightful conversation about what needs to be done to help this passage towards greater inclusivity. Thank you for having me on. I'm sorry we didn't have time to, to go further. Washington Post Live will be back at 5.15 this afternoon with Jackson, Mississippi Mayor Chokwe Lumumba. Don't miss that, 5.15 this afternoon Eastern, and thank you so much for joining me for three very insightful conversations.